Right, okay. Um, brilliant, Barry, it's great to see you. We talked about doing this for a while, yeah. and um, I think we spoke before Fight Camp. And I said the next time I speak to you, or Jazza, one of you will be the uh, world no, champ. You said, when I, next time I speak to you, you will be the world IBF champion of the whole world. Not a little bit of it, but the whole world. I said, I will be. How does it feel? Good, mate. It feels good. I feel no different. Um, on to the next one. Afterwards, we, we spoke, and you were full of praise for basically everyone but yourself, and you wanted to put shout-outs to Jazza and to Dominic. Yeah, because at the end of the day, if it wasn't for Jazza, I wouldn't have got. I wouldn't have fought that night. And if it wasn't for Dominic, I wouldn't be in this position. There's, you know, the thing is, yeah, I'm in the ring and I'm getting in the ring to fight. But you've got to remember, it's, there's a lot behind the scenes. You know, if Eddie didn't put the show on, if the zone didn't do it, the fight wouldn't have happened. You know what I mean? If John Ingle wasn't managing Tom with certain things, what to do, it wouldn't happen. If Dan Foster, my solicitor, didn't do the contract, it wouldn't have happened. There's a lot of people. You know, if I didn't meet Brendan, I wouldn't have been in this position. Yeah, so tell me, obviously we're here in the famous Ingle gym. Tell me about some of the people that are working here behind the scenes and who we might have seen this morning. This morning we're seeing the gym manager, Carl Lukak. You know, he's in, he opens the gym every single day, make sure the gym's tidy, make sure we all get tied up. Our gloves always, you know, when we're in there training or sparring or doing anything, he makes sure we've got our waters, our gloves are tied, just little bits like that. Dominic Ingle, the main coach, is always in here training us. Um, we've got John Ingle, who's Jim, well, my manager. You know, he comes in, watches, sees what we're doing, tells me little things, you know, what, what I need to practice on. And, and for instance, and then we've got all the other fighters, you know, the list goes on and on. It's a good bustling gym. And, you, you know, we should just add here that this isn't like a novelty that you're in training straight after winning a world title. You've actually been in... You came in the Monday afterwards. Yeah, I, I come in the day after the fight. I went in, you know, I didn't... To be fair with you, I come out with nothing really on me after the fight. You know, the only thing was, I think I might be a bit allergic to Vaseline because my face was a bit swollen in terms of my skin. But then after I washed it off, I was all right. You know, I think I get irritated with Vaseline me. It's been an 18-year journey for you to be a world champ. Yeah. Um, how did it feel lifting the belt up? Felt, it felt good, but, you know, I just feel like there's still more, you know. I don't feel like... The thing is, I always knew I was going to be a world champion. Even when I was the age of 16, 17, I used to spar people who, box, who were fighting for world titles, like Randy Monroe, and I used to batter him from pillar to post, you know, and he was fighting for a world title, and I was only like 16, 17 at the time. And there's loads of, you know, loads of champions I sparred, I sparred a guy called John Thaxton once and he got the ring and says, because you know you, you're going to be world champion. The list goes on and on. And, um, but now, you know, I've got the world title. I want a unified division. I want to get all the belts if I, could, if I can. I, I probably won't be able to get the WBA, the WBC because they're tied down with PBC. But I think I'll be able to, you know, get my defence out of the way. In, this, in November, December in Sheffield, then we'll try and get um, the WBO. You were born in Doha, right? Yeah, Qatar, Doha. Um, so I read it, it said that you were born in Doha, but originally from Yemen. Yeah, my, my dad's actually, um, so basically, my mum's actually from Sheffield. So my mum, my grandparents are from Yemen, they moved to Doha because my grandma was working over there. And then, my mum, they come over here to England to get a job and everything else because I think it was just different at them times. My grandparents moved to Sheffield. They worked in the steel factories. Then they saved enough money, went back to Doha to live there. And then my mum met my dad. My dad was in the military. He was in the special forces in Qatar. And then they got married. Then they had the kids. And then one day they turned around and just says, oh, look, you know, uh, my dad come from Yemen over to Qatar. And then they just turned around to my dad and said, oh, we're going to do a deal with the US that they're going to be our special, uh, they're going to be our marine, uh, army now. So Qatar doesn't have an army. America's their army. Right. So they sent, they sent their armies home. So I remember saying, it's when I spoke to my dad after, he says, oh, he was always devastated because he loved it. He loved being a marine. He was like a special marine and he loved it. 
and then he didn't know what to do. Then my, dad, my granddad told him, oh, why don't you go to England, come over to England to Liverpool, bought a shop. I lived there until I was about four or five years old with my grandparents. And then when they settled in, they sent for me and I come over to Liverpool to live with them. Age four? At, at four, five years old, yeah. Um, do you remember anything before that? In what? In before what? you came to Liverpool? Yeah, when we lived in Qatar, I, I, most of the time I spent with my grandparents. Okay. So just like little, we lived in a, in a rough house. Oh my God, in Qatar it was. But the thing was, there was nothing there at the time. You know, like now it's completely different. They've got massive skyscrapers. and But in them times, I'm on about, this is like 25 years ago, there were literally nothing. It was just a desert. And then just like little shacks. And now if you went over there and seen it, it's completely different. So how hard was the move to Liverpool and then to Sheffield, having, have, you know, because it's such a massive contrast? The thing was, when I come over from Qatar, my grandparents come back to Sheffield and I went to live with my fa um my um, mum and dad in Liverpool. And I always remember this, it was hard because, you know, when I lived with my grandparents, it was just me. So, you know, like you were the spoiled one. And then I remember going to Liverpool and then I was bang on the middle child. And then there were so many of us in the house. They were like, we lived in a three bedroom house. There was, I had two older brothers, two older sisters, then me, then a younger brother. Then my, um, my dad was looking after my his my dad's sisters are widows so my dad's sisters sent their kid over you know to help my dad in the shop right so my cousin Edward, Edward, his name's anywhere he lived with us and then my my aunt my mum's sister sent her kids two kids to live with us as well yusuf and amani so we were all literally and then it was just literally it was just when i think about it now it was just mad it was just it was a three-bedroom house we, everyone was sleeping everywhere, literally, you know, we, there was a bump beds in each room. So my mum and dad had their bedroom, then the other room was a bump beds. So then, you know, two people slept on two, the other one slept two, the other slept on the floor, then the same in the other room, do you know what I mean? And, but the thing was, that was probably the best time of your life. Did the special forces thing ever appeal to you? Did, was that something you ever contemplated? No, no, the, my dad, you know, when I was a kid, my dad never talked about it, it was only until I got older. And I just said to him, I said, what did you ever do? Why did you ever leave? And then he told, oh, I was in the forces. But before then, I never knew. Did he see a lot of action and that kind of stuff? Do yeah, you know? um, I don't know, because in them times, it might have been a bit different. I saw you wanted to box because uh, it was uh, an alternative to gang life that your brothers were into. Is, yeah. that, is that true? Yeah, the thing was, we were like, my dad, my mum and dad's shop did really well. But the thing was, there were so many of us you know, if my mum and dad just had two kids, we would have had an unbelievable life. We would have been, oh my God, we would have had the best life ever. But we probably would have been spoiled kids. But the thing was, my dad had so many responsibilities that we couldn't, because, you know, in Yemen, he had to look after his mum and dad. And then he had to look after his two sisters who were widows. I think it's two or three. And then he had to look after their kids. Then he had to look after his own kids. You know, because in Yemen there isn't nothing, there wasn't nothing for them to do. There's where they are, there's nothing. Yeah. And then he had to look after his own kids and his do you know, and then my mum's mum and dad they had to look after as well. So there was a lot of so really when I think about it now, they were probably looking after like, I don't know, sixteen, seventeen people. So imagine how hard it was. You know, it's hard looking after one person. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think it's hard just looking after me. Imagine that you have to look after sixteen or seventeen people. So how did the move come from Liverpool to Sheffield? So mum and dad split up and then my dad decided to go back over to uh, move countries to Dubai. And then we decided to live with mum in Sheffield. But the thing was, because um, mum was actually from Sheffield, she's from Upper Fort Sheffield. And um, it was just different, you know, like where we lived in Liverpool was so rough. It was so, so rough. I just always remember one time someone got shot just across the road from our house and we were not allowed to play outside. We had to just like, literally, we had to, when the ball, if we kicked the ball down the road, we had to knock on, oh mum, can we go and get the ball? Then she'd go, no, go send someone else to go and get the ball for us. That's how bad it was. Jeez. Um, tell me about any examples of racism. Did you experience any? 
Um, yeah, a little bit, but like, even before I come to the gym, I was never like heavily like I don't know because you know sometimes people can they're not racist, but they say that they're, it's not politically correct. You know, especially old people, but they're not racist, if you know what I mean. That's just how, in their time, that's how it was. And, you know, it just depends. I think the only time when someone's like, you know, it depends like when you meet a middle-aged man or a, a kid and the way they say it, you know, they can go, oh, you know, pack you or whatever it is, or, you know, you're black bastard. Then it depends how they say it. Well, most times it's like, you know, say, oh, what are you saying? Most people say, oh, you know, what are you saying, my nigger, or, what are you, you know, that you're going to pack a shop. I don't find that racist. Some people might do, but I don't. Do you know what I mean? I think it just depends on how you, how it comes across. You're not easily offended? No, I'm not easily offended, no. Um, I mentioned, obviously, the, the gang stuff. Did your brothers go into the gang life? Yeah, you know, my, all my brothers were, uh, one of them is still locked up now. You know, he's probably not going to come out for a long time. And they've what, all, what all of them, all sorts, some serious stuff. And they've all been, you know, in and out of jail. But the thing was, when we were kids, we didn't really know no one who was like a doctor or a dentist or professional or anything. You know, the only people we know were professional drug dealers or professional, you know, gangsters or robbers or that was it. Do you know what I mean? Especially when we went from Liverpool to Sheffield. That even when we moved from Toxteth to Upperfolk, it was still the same thing. The only thing was, when we lived in Liverpool, it was on a higher level. But what made you different then? Why didn't you go down that route? Because I met Brendan. If I didn't meet Brendan, if I didn't meet Naz at the local mosque and I come over here and met Brendan and could walk to this gym, I probably would have been a criminal or a gangster or a murderer or something to do in them lines. So tell me about that first meeting with Naz. And so when you first saw him, how old were you? And did you I, already know who he was? I, yeah, we knew who Naz was because we, you know, oh, we used to watch his fights because obviously he was from the same, he was from Yemen. And um, I know he's, me and my friend Tris went to a gym in town because we were skinny. We were about 10, 11 years old. And at that time, gyms wouldn't, you know, if you're too young, they wouldn't let you sign up. So we spoke to his dad, he goes, oh, there's a gym in town. This guy let you train in there, you know, get a bit bigger. So we went to this gym and it was just like a little crappy gym. And um, he had a boxing ring in there and we used to go in there afterwards. We used to do a little bit messing about, chucking weights about. And then we used to just get in there and spar a bit, me and my friend Tris. And then, you know, uh, one day after like, literally it might have been two weeks, I went to the local mosque and I seen Naz there. And, you know, I wasn't, like, starstruck or anything like that. It was just like, oh, you know, just Naz. I said, oh, Naz. I said, I've just started boxing. I said, I want to be a champion like you. What have I got to do? He goes, if you want to be a champion like me, he goes, you need to go and find this guy called Brendan Ingle. He's got a gym in St. Thomas's Club in Winkerbank. He goes, if you go and get it, if you find him, he goes, he'll make you into a champion. So I went home, ran, I said, oh, mum, and, and I want to look for this gym. But Naz said, if I go here, he'll make me into a champion. Went there, mum said, all right, come on, then we got in the car found the gym, and walked into here, and the rest is history. What was your first impression walking in? Did you see Brendan that first day? Yeah, do you know what it was? It was like three or four o'clock, which is the busiest time as well. I remember I walked into this gym, and um, obviously when you walk in, it stinks a bit. But when, you, when you've been here for that long, you don't realise the smell. So I walked in, I thought, it smells a bit in here. And I remember the gym was just packed. And I walked down to the bottom of the, just down here, and I looked up and I just seen Johnny Nelson, Junior Witter, Kelbrook, Ryan Rose, all these guys sparring. And because the ring's a bit raised, I looked and thought, oh my God, they all look like giants. You know what I mean? I thought, oh, I want to be like these. And then from that point, I knew that's what I was going to do. So you, so Naz, at the time, Naz and Brendan were estranged. Yeah, they were, they were not. They were not. Even when I come down here, Brendan thought it was like a setup or something. Yeah, you know? that was it. So Dom told me years ago that they, that Brendan wasn't sure that you weren't a spy. Yeah, he thought I was a spy at first. Because you said Naz told me to come yeah. down here. Yeah, and then Brendan coming in and he kind of like, he was a bit wary of me and he thought, oh, it must be a spy or something, this kid. Do you know what I mean? And then even the things what he said to me, hey, come down tomorrow morning, be here for um, 6.45. So I got up, I caught tram. On the tram, it's like 45 minutes from where I am in, in Sheffield to come to this gym. So I got up at 5.45, got here for like half past six, waited outside, 15 minutes went by, thought he might be on time, didn't, you know, 
seven it, seven o'clock come. He, he wasn't here, quarter past seven, he wasn't half past seven, he come in, he walked over. And then I was waiting outside, we're freezing cold. And I was there and he's opened the gym for me and he'd come in, he showed me my footwork. And he says, I'll oh, just go in, just do the, do these lines. I'll be back in half an hour, seven, half seven, half eight, half nine, half 10. Next minute, I see a guy, the door open a little tiny bit, and someone's head just popping like that. And with Brendan, he looked and he disappeared. And he went and he come back an hour after. He looked again and seen if I was here, still doing the same thing, and I was. Then he come in and give me a sandwich. Then he says, oh, come, we're going to go over to the church and do some work. Then we, went, we had to like um, cut the grass, do a bit of work on the back of the grass while he was talking to me. Then we did that until from like 12 till 3, come back in, and he showed me another thing to do with my feet. And he made me do the same again. From 3 till about 6 o'clock, he goes, that's it, and I go home. I'll see you tomorrow morning at the same time. Come the next day, did the same for about... It might have been for about two or three weeks I was just doing my footwork, nothing else. Yeah, so Dom says that he made you, that Brendan made you do all the crappy drills yeah. um, to test you, to see if you were a spy. Because if you were a spy, you'd just lose interest yeah. and you'd be gone. But the thing was with Brendan, because he said to me, because Nas said to me, oh, if you want to be a champion, you've got to listen to, to Brendan. And, I, and when I met Brendan, he goes, oh yeah, if you want to be a champion, just do this. And I thought, well, if this guy's telling me this is what I've got to do, then this is what I've got to do. So did you buy into what Brendan said because you took to him straight away or because Naz had said? No, because the, the thing with Brendan, when you meet Brendan, you just know straight away he's just a genuine person. There's nothing about him. Brendan's not sneak or crafty or anything like that. When you meet him straight away, you just know. I think I've got a good judgment of character with people. And when you met Brendan, you just knew straight away. You know, there's no one in Sheffield or I know who slagged Brendan off. And even the people who did say, you know, this and that, oh, yeah, Brendan, and after a bit, they all come up and, you know, oh, yeah, Brendan did this, and I met loads of people, and they've slagged him off, and then afterwards, like, oh, yeah, you know, he did this and did that for me, and I just think sometimes people get jealous of him. Mm. Uh, at what point did you become Kid Galahad? Well, when I was about 16, 17, I, I won the Nationals, I think, 17 and 18, I won the Nationals, and then all I wanted to be was a pro, but I wasn't bothered about. I remember I beat a kid in the amateurs and they, in the final, I beat him, in, I beat him, won the, the championship and they picked him to go to the Europeans and didn't pick me. But I wasn't bothered. It didn't really bother me enough. And I thought they might give me a call up or something. But I wasn't ever bothered about the amateurs because all I wanted to be was a world champion. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to go to the Olympics or anything like that. I was never bothered. I just wanted to be, you know, a multi-weight world champion. I wanted to be like, you know, the Marvin Aglers, the Sugar Ray Leonard's, you know, all them kind of fighters, you know, um, who was Nick, what's his name? Archie Moore. I like the really old school fighters. That's, that's the people I wanted to be like. I didn't want to be, go to the Olympics and win a gold medal. That never... It never, um, it never appealed. It never appealed for me. Um, so tell me a bit about your amateur career. What did you do? How many fights? And I had, I turned, I turned amateur. I might have been 12, 13. And I remember I, I, I had, I might have been like 15 and all, you know, before I got beat. But I didn't know what I was doing. I was crap. But I was fighting from 54 to like 60. That was the that was the weight catcher. I was just you know because the thing was before then people would go to me oh yeah I had like fifteen or sixteen fights in amateurs. I was having average like nine or ten, and um, and then the first season it was all right, but I didn't really know what I was doing. Then this, then I just kept on going, kept on. And the second season was a bit thingy, you know, like a bit hit and miss because you you're kind of learning what you're doing. Then my last two seasons. I never got beat. I won every. I, I beat everyone. At what point did you fight Josh Warrington? In the amateurs, that was my. That was my. So when I, I was about fifteen, when I when Josh Warrington beat me, he beat me twice. Josh Warrington, but the difference was, we were kids then, and Josh Warrington. He was a bit like how he is now, but he was he was very mature for a kid. If you know what I'm saying, he was very physically mature. Sure. So. Josh Warrington won a lot of things as an amateur, as a junior, but as a senior, he never won nothing. Because all the kids, when we were kids, he was more mature than all he of us. He was ahead of them. He was ahead of everyone. Yeah. He was just physically more mature. But then when we got older, 
he stopped he stopped winning things. People started to catch up. Yeah, because he wasn't he was just phys, he was more f- physical. And even towards the end, you know, they said they claimed that oh he got robbed and he got this and I he never he just got beat because he couldn't lose everyone caught upon him in, in his physical in their physical size and everything else, physical strengths. Um Tell me about your journey from the gym to the gym. You said it was 45 minutes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. That... So were you doing that daily? So the thing was, yeah, I was doing that. So when I come to this gym, yeah. I didn't go to school. I was kicked out of school at the time. For but what? Brendan did not. Oh, I beat up a te- me and my brother beat up a teacher. But the thing was, it was like, you know, we used to just do mad stuff like that for no reason. I think basically... Badly? No, we didn't beat him up badly. Basically, I was getting a bit of a scrap with someone, this teacher just kind of like grabbed me in a weird way and he kind of like ragged me. So then I'm fine with the teacher. Then my brother come from nowhere flying, chucked a, a, a chair at him. Then we were scrapping with his teacher. Then I ended up getting kicked out. Then he ended up getting kicked out a week after. But then we couldn't get into no schools because there was a, a ban, because we, we got kicked out of like three or four schools before that. They put a ban on us where basically it had to be a three mile radius between us. Right. So we couldn't go to school in this in this three mile radius. He had to go one to one school, and I had to go to a one, you know, three miles away. So then we couldn't really find one because we wanted one right near my nan's house. Do you know what I mean? Where we were living. So then when I come here, Brendan didn't really know. So for about a month or two, he didn't realise I wasn't going to school enough. And so then he goes, me, oh, I've realised why don't you ever go to school? Why you not at school? So oh, Brendan, I got kicked out. Because I get your school get in. Got me took me to the got me in the car, went up to Hind House, went to the head teacher, said, Oh, he's he's he ain't got a school, can you get him to a school? They went, Yeah, come in Monday. Got me into he goes, If you get kicked out of school, there was a teacher called Mrs. Robinson and he goes, If he gets kicked out of the school, I'm gonna kick him out of the gym. So if he does anything wrong, just tell me. And I thought, Oh my god, I can't can't get into trouble now. Then I went to a school in Hind House and he went to a school and my other brother went to a school in King Edwards. Because I think you said after you beat uh, Jazza the other day, you had, it was a two bus ride journey, was it? From yeah, yeah, it was. The, the thing was, it was a two bus ride journey, but I think I, I had an 18 month ban where I weren't allowed to catch buses because I was kicked off all buses as well. So then. Yeah, so you got quite a lot of previous then? Yeah, but it went nothing ever serious. It was just like, it was, it was just like stupid stuff, you know what I mean? And um, the thing was, when, when we started getting to serious crime, like my brothers, it might have been like in that six month period where I started coming here, where they all started getting to, so Deep like 11, waters. 12, yeah, yeah, 11, 12 years old. When I, when they, when we, when they started getting to like serious crime, I kind of come to the gym. It kind of like, that was the, you know what I mean? If, if I didn't come to the gym in that period, then I would have been involved in some, in some stuff. Who were some of the kids that you, or not kids, but who were some of the people you sparred here that you remember sort of early sessions with? Ah, oh, in the mornings or it was just there's everyone. Do you know the thing is there's that many people what have come into this is there gym. Anything that stands out though when you think you know you were fourteen, fifteen, and you were sparring with you know a big name or whatever. Yeah, I used to spar Junior with Johnny Nelson, um, Ryan Rhodes. Um, what was, kind of sparring? Like we've seen today. Yeah, like body, body sparring. sparring yeah, 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 body sparring. Buster Keaton. You remember I was like eight stone went through. So these kids, these were battering, these were battering me badly. Do you know what I mean? There were loads, but they, there was... It's funny because people here will hear about body sparring yeah. here at the Ingle Gym. And, and I've, I've said on the podcast before, like some of the most ferocious sparring I've seen has been the body sparring here. Yeah. And which is why when you say to me, every time I come up here, come and do some rounds, I say, no, I've seen I know, it. But I the thing is with you, because you're, you're, you know, you you're in good shape, you've got good conditioning, you'll doesn't be all right. There, you know, you, it? It you, you're fit as a fiddle, you've got good, you know, you're <clears> up to cross training and stuff like that. I can so. see you and Killer Khan, who's another guy I want you to yeah. tell me a bit about as well. You and Killer Khan lick your lips when I come in here, thinking it's fresh meat. Yeah, Killer Killer would, would try and kill you. He'd stick it on me, wouldn't he? Yeah, he, that's why we call him Killer. So he's, so p- for people who don't know, he's obviously one of the big characters up here. He yeah. was about 11 and 12 and 0 as a pro. Yeah. He, and he used to give Carl Froch nightmares. Yeah, yeah. he used to spar Carl Froch. Um, he sparred everyone. A killer. He, he's been around for years. He used to spar Johnny he, Nelson. He was, he was in Billy Joe's entourage, God yeah, for Canelo, yeah. quite recently. Billy Joe well. loves him. And, and the thing with Killer is, he, he even was involved in the Nas, you know, in the Nas days. So Killer's been in this gym a long time. Yeah. 
and um, he just knows all the old tricks and keeps himself fit. He's always in the gym. He's always training. He's a he's actually a fireman now. That's his 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 proper job, and um, he just loves it, doesn't he? He loves being around boxing. That's all he's done all his life. But we'll never spar. You know that. Might be one day. Never say never. <laughs> never say never. No, I mean. If, I've told you before as well, Claude and Naz, Claude, who's been on the podcast, spa, came up here, sparred Naz. Naz ended up giving him a bloody nose and all the rest of it. I know, but that I can way. see the way you look at me. You're, you want to test something. We're going to I'm gonna have to just cancel <laughs> this interview and put a ban on you until you get in the ring and do some body sparring. Did you, what was it, have you worked? Have you had jobs? Yeah, when I was younger, when I was, um, when I was like 14 or 15, and then... When I was coming back and forth, Brendan says to me, oh, look, the next step, what you've got to do, he goes, you've got to move out of that house and move that out of that area and get a house next to the gym. So I said, oh, I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? So then I got, like, a cleaning job with my mum and I was only getting, like, 50 quid a week. Every It was like, might have been, like, from six till seven, just an hour, just cleaning, like, offices and stuff. And um, I was getting, like, 60 pound a week so then i said to john ingle he's got a house around here have you got anything i can rent he says yeah there's a house down the road the post office so i was living in this house in the post office there was like me john bagley lee noble um lee duncan adnan amar and the house was a tip it was an absolute tip and uh, i lived there with them from that age what was that like a fun house no, it was terrible because you know what it was? <laughs> Chaos. It was just, there were, there were tramps. They were like, they were always fine arguing, putting electricity or gas on a week. Do you know what I mean? Because basically I lived there full time, but they used to go home on the weekend then. Right. So they'd be up from like Monday till Thursday or Friday. So on the weekend, sometimes there were no gas or electricity. And I'd be like, oh, you know, like put some in. But it was just like, it was hard work just to get like, you know, off them just some money just to put into the uh, unless you're seeing gas and um, it were good times though you know because that's what makes you sure you said uh, you wanted to turn pro and be world champion from a, a young age at what point did Brendan say to you you can do it when I, when I come into the gym when I, within that two weeks he says oh look because you're going to win everything from you know super and weight up to you know lightweight light world to weight he says you can win everything what when you're 13 he said yeah that. 13 14 yeah he says to me, he goes, all you got to do is come in here, listen to what I'm telling you and do this. And I thought, oh, you know, like, that's going to be good. Do you know what I mean? And then even things when he told me, you know, like, about Nassim Hamed, he says, oh, he should have won everything from, you know, featherweight to, to like, middleweight. And people used to think he was crazy. You know, oh, no one's ever done that before. What's he on about? You know, how can a guy like that small do that? But look what Manu Pacquiao's gone and done. You know, realistically, is Manu Pacquiao as, as talented as Nassim Hamed? He's not. Is Floyd Mayweather as talented as Nassim Hamed? No, he's not. They just probably had a bit more discipline than him. And, you know, people, I always say, I always felt like Nassim Hamed underachieved. He did achieve a lot, but I believe he should have been on the same level as when people say Pacquiao's and the Arlies and them. That's why I believe Nas should have been. Is that... One of the is that a cautionary tale for you? The fact that Naz took his foot off the the gas and yeah, helped you live the life. Does is that yeah. something that plays in your it plays? Yeah, in your it mind? does. You know, the thing was Naz should have been. He is still a living legend, but it, for me, he should have been. When they say the one of the best fighters of all time, he his name should be up there, sealed, without a shadow of doubt. Or you know, he, in in British boxing, he probably is. But we're on about in the his, in, in the world. When they boxing say, legends. yeah, boxing legend. When yeah. they, he is one of them, but you could still argue and say, oh yeah, but this and that, you know, is he in the top ten or top twenty? But realistically, he should have been in, in the top five at least, because that's how good he was. After your pro debut, do you remember what Boxing News wrote? No. So it said Sheffield-based Yemeni uh, Kigar had is not the new Nassim Hamed. No, I didn't. I never. What did you think about that? Never, I didn't even know. It's, um, it's an interesting thing that you were drawing comparisons. Obviously, the fact that you're both from, you, you know, yeah. got Yemeni descent and you're both out of the, the Ingle gym. 
But there were comparisons drawn between you guys from the from the very get go. Yeah, of course there was. You know, Naz is a well. You know, when you think about it, you know them even comparing me to Naz is crazy, isn't it? You know, that's like imagine I don't know someone getting compared to Maradona or you know even getting compared to him is a big big thing. And you know, there's never going to be another Naz. There's ne they never, you know, that's just how it is. Was Brendan saying that you're going to be a new Naz? No, he never said that. Didn't he? No, he never said that. He never said to me, "Oh, you're going to be the new Naz." He never. He says you can achieve more than Naz achieved. He goes, "But this is what you've got to do." You know, but there's never, there's never going to be another Naz or another Mike Tyson or. Another that's just Chigalad how it. Yeah, there's never, there's worse. never going to be another me. That's just how it is. You know, that's just. I suppose when you have a successful gym, though, particularly if you've got a successful fighter from a, a gym, regardless of where the gym is or who the fighter is, someone's always going to be compared to that. It was like when, um, just for example, when Tommy Morrison went up to Catskill to train with Kevin Rooney. Yeah. He's not the new Mike Tyson. Yeah. But, that, but, but even getting compared to him is still a big thing, and it? it's like... Sure. Pressure. You, is it yeah, pressure? Not really, because it's, it's, I think it depends. Some people might take it as pressure, and some don't. But really, there's never gonna be, there's never gonna be another Floyd. There's never gonna be another Pacquiao. There's never gonna be. There might be someone better than them, but there's never gonna be them. You won you, um, six of your first eight. You, you had to go the distance. Were they good learning fights? Um, yeah. So against yeah. the likes of Ian Bailey, Sid Razak, those guys. Yeah, you know the thing was when I was, I was just probably, when I was that age, I was very, I was a late developer. You know, I was always skin and bone, and and um, the thing was, when I was an amateur, I used to fight featherweight. Then when I turned pro, I thought, oh, I best get lower, do you know, because I wasn't physically strong enough for the featherweights at the time. And I think me getting down wasn't a good idea. I should have stayed as a featherweight and filled out, but I didn't. I went down them low weights, and I think it just took away a bit of strength and a bit of popping me shots. Interesting. When. When you turned pro, you were with Mick Hennessy, was that right? Yeah, that was right, yeah. Why did you go with Mick? Um, because at the time, John Ingle was doing things with Mick Hennessy and everything else. And, you know, John Ingle was, and Dominic Ingle were, were um, directing my career. So, you know, I, I ain't got no experience in boxing. So whatever they told me to do, I did. Because it's my, it's my, it's my judgment of character in terms of in this in industrial, in this environment, in this game or this business, business yeah. do, I, do I have any experience? I don't have no experience, so why would I, you know? What did you make of Mick? He, you know what, the thing with Mick, Mick was good. You know, he was a nice guy. He was just lazy, you know, in terms of lazy, in terms of like, he just left everything to last minute. You know, he was a nice guy. I, I really not got a bad word to say about Mick Hennessy. But just in terms of like to promote a fight or to do this, he just left everything to last minute. If you think about it, he had me, he had Tyson Fury, he had Carl Froch, he had Darren Barker, he had Chris Eubank Jr., he had James DeGale. Who else did he have? Oh my God! Well, uh, John Murray was John Murray was, was doing well at the he time. He had the um, the guy Box Hopkins, the, uh, Howard Eastman. Howard Eastman. Yep. That's like. A bit of a who's who of that six world champions is gone, and two of them who haven't, but they were good fighters. Yeah. Um, over the years, you've had a, a close relationship with Tyson Fury. How did that start? Was that because you were guys? Were yeah, with you know, is yeah. That how that started? We were boxing the same shows and stuff like that, and um, I used to watch his fights and he watched my fight. But the thing is, he came to this gym to train a few times, and he sparred Johnny Nelson when he was about 17, 18, and even then, Johnny says, "Oh, he'll win everything him," because. Johnny's tricky, Johnny's got all the moves. But even then, you know, Tyson still could hold his own. And he's he spotted towers here as well, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he spotted towers here, yeah. And he could hold his own. And you just knew from then. It just, it looked weird because stuff what he was doing. He's so big when he does the things he was doing. It didn't look right because you don't actually see big guys doing what he does. But for his, Tyson Fury's main thing and the best thing about him, he's very well coordinated for a big guy, which you don't ever see in big people. When you see people that, when you see giants. They're a bit cumbersome and that. Yeah, they're a bit, that. yeah, a bit like clumsy or, but he's not, he's in the ring when he's fighting especially, he's actually very well coordinated. 
you know that's his main why did you and him hit it off because like, like i said this this friendship be, because endures. we're similar styles aren't we we've got similar styles the thing is i think when you appreciate someone's what they do you you appreciate don't you you know what i mean like like a mutual respect though. yeah you know like he probably the name of the game is to hit and not get hit but tyson can do a bit of everything mm. just like me and i can do and the name of the like i said to you we are very similar in terms of our styles are are similar he, we just, I don't know, because we just, we appreciate what we both do. You know what I mean? Um, against Jason Booth, people thought it might be a 50-50 fight going into yeah. it. It was at the time. But it you wasn't. won well, and Jason Booth said afterwards, he reminds me of a younger version of me. Yeah, the thing was, I, you know, I remember when I boxed Jason Booth, and I trained so hard because I thought, it's my first title. So everything I've got to do, I've got to do more of. And about two weeks before, I got ill. And I thought, oh, my God. And even when I boxed him, I was still ill. But I just thought, I can't lose this fight. I've got to win. Because if I don't win this, there's nothing. I've got, I'm have got. i going to go back to that crappy little house where I've got uh, sleeping on the mattress. I thought, I've got to lose. I've got to win, no matter what. And even though I was probably like 40 50% when I boxed him, you know, I still pulled it out. Um, and then came Josh Whale. Yeah. Josh and I actually boxed on the same bill many years ago. Did you? As, as Bloody, amateurs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was Josh like? I think what when I boxed Josh, he looked at the Jason Booth fight and thought, oh, he got dropped in this fight. But he didn't know I was ill at the time. And he thought, oh, he's skin and bone. I'm going to flatten this kid. And then when I boxed Josh Whale, I thought, you know, I changed a few things. I didn't overtrain. And then when I got in there, I battled from pillar to post. But he was tough. And um, afterwards, I remember him saying, it's just, I thought, you know, when, you, when I watched your box, when I watched your box, Jason, I thought I was going to walk through you. And I just thought, you know, that you can't, you can't think like that, you know what I mean? And uh, because he, he boxed a kid in our gym called Muhammad al Suri, who was like, who was a good kid. And, and Josh Well ended up stopping him. And I was there when he stopped him. How much confidence did it give you boxing the, the bigger lumps in this gym when you went out and then fought people your own size? That you'd done rounds with people like Junior and Kel and stuff? Because it's a different look and a different feel altogether, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But the thing is, it, it's like, I don't know, you don't... When you get in there, it's just, it's just mad, isn't it? Because I always think when people say, oh, you know, he's not big enough or strong enough. And I just think, they haven't got a clue. Do you know? And then when they get in there, or when I... Most times when I get in a fight, people always think, oh, you know, I'm going to, he's not strong enough or he's not this or he's not that. And then when they get in the ring afterwards, they're always like, oh, you know, I actually thought he's actually better than he looks. Or but I think that's probably my best thing. People, I think people are coming around now to the fact that you can pretty much do, do it all, really. Yeah. And I think the thing is, though, people always look and think, oh, you know, he's not this and he's that. But, you know, but then when they get in there and they realise I can, it kind of... I don't know, I just think after I fight people, they're never the same again. What do you prefer doing? Do you prefer being on the front foot? Do you prefer countering? What's your, what's your, um, what the I don't, you I the don't, I just, out? the thing is you've got to do what you've got to do to win. It's actually, it, it, I don't prefer anything in that, in the ring. I don't, there's not a place or a situation that I don't not feel comfortable in because you know, when you practice, I want to be one of them fighters that can do everything, can box a bit, can fight a bit, can do every little, th because the thing is you don't want to be one of the fighters where, yeah, he can box a bit, but then, you know, if you stick it on him, he'll fall apart or, you know, he can fight him, but, you know, if you box him, you can, you can beat him up, you can box his head off clean. I didn't want to be one of the fighters. I wanted to be one of the fighters, just like a Marvin Agler or, a, you know, a Andre Ward or Hopkins who can do everything, mm. who can do everything, and they're the hardest fighters to beat. And I believe they're the fighters that last the longest. Can Jorge Linares do everything? You boxed him in last week. Um, you sparred him. Yeah, I fought Harley. No, because I think when I sparred Harley Linares, I didn't know who he was at the time. And he didn't know who you were? No, I, he didn't know either. But the thing, when I got in the ring with him, because I remember there the was Sid, and I watched him spar some guy, and this guy was useless. And he went, bam, bam, and knocked this kid out sparked him out but this kid was useless i'm telling you, i wouldn't even lose this kid as far as myself and I looked and i thought oh he's all right but you know i thought no was all right but i didn't 
I didn't ever think he was anything because I was sparring. I sparred Kel, so I thought this and Kel's a world to it. They actually wanted to spar Kel, not me. And then goes, oh no, no, Kel be too big for him. Let me spar, you know, this kid here. And they probably thought, oh look, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna flatten him. Kel would have flattened him. Kel would have walked through him. If he, but if he had sparred Kel at that point, he probably would have not boxed ever again. So what happened when you sparred him? So when I got in the ring and I sparred him, and I just I got in there and I thought. He was all right, but he was trying to he was trying to tip my head off with every shot. But it's weird because he's not heavy handed. He's sharp. And you know, I was just making him fall short, making him fall short. And I realised he was he had fast feet, but his sorry, he had fast hands, but his feet weren't the best. So I'd pop and I'd just step out. Then he'd have to reset again. Then I'd pop and then I'd step out again. Then I'd, and then I realised he this guy can only throw shots when his feet are planted. So then I just kept on popping, moving them, switching, and he didn't actually know what to do. He was just kind of like, he just kind of stopped throwing things because he didn't know. Because every time he threw, he was missing or he was falling over himself. It's great. I mean, some of the some of the stories about you going over and sparring Amer- America, some of the funniest. I, I sparred uh, Oscar Valdez. How America. did that go? It was good. He sparred. Where was that? Was that in Vegas or LA? <sighs> it might be in LA. I think. Yeah, it was in LA. And it was all right, but I didn't think anything. I thought he was very small for a, uh, for a super animal. I thought he's tiny, and he he switches he switches as well. And I thought he was okay, but I didn't think he was anything. But I don't think he is anything, you know, special. I think he's, he's, he's done he's, all right he, for himself. Yeah, he has, he has, but I don't think he is. You know, I don't think there isn't anyone who he's beat, and I think, oh, I can't, I could not beat him. I never, do you know what I mean? And I don't think he's ever beat anyone. I thought, oh my God, that was absolute. Apart from his last win, which is which is a good win, sure. I don't think he's had any fights where I was like, oh my God, that was unbelievable. Well, he had a war with Scott Quigg, and you sparred Quigg as well. Yeah. What happened with that? With who? With Scott Quigg. No, oh, box it off, clean off. But that's what that's the thing. I think sometimes I can read fights where I'm like, oh, as long as I know I can box this guy, I can box his head off. If if you know, if I've got to change it and have a bit of a fight with this guy, then I'll change it. But with Scott Quigg, I didn't know why, you know, someone like Oscar Valdez went in there and had a complete war with him. And I think even to this day, I don't think he's still the same since that fight. Sure. Because that was a heavy fight. Yeah. Cause Scott Quigg can bang. Mm. He was strong, he was tough. He wasn't technically any great, but he was tough and he could punch. Dom and he was fit as a fiddle. Dom told me this story, by the way. Sparring Joseph Higbico uh, in the Mayweather gym. Yeah. Uh, eight months after he'd come off a loss to Rigondo, uh, every day Barry got a hassle going into the Mayweather gym, so we arranged the sparring with our Bico. Uh, they set the spar at six rounds, five minutes each round, because Mayweather did five-minute rounds. Yeah. Uh, Agbico came out at breakneck speed for two rounds. Round three, the trainer called Barry over to rub some Vaseline in his gloves. Also gave them a squeeze, because our Bico must have thought Barry had something in his gloves. Yeah. Uh, round four, the kid was gassed. At the end of round six, he tapped Barry's gloves and jumped out two rounds short of the six. Yeah, yeah, he did. Uh, we looked over at the trainer. He just looked at the floor. After all the hangers on were around, uh, asking Barry uh, who he was, uh, how many fights he had, etc. Uh, if you remember, Agbiko pulled out on the night against Barry on ITV show yeah. a few years back. Yeah, yeah, that was it, yeah. So it was quite funny because you, you know, certainly back then, you were quite anonymous and you were going to America and fighting all these guys. I guess a lot of people were thinking, who the hell are you? Yeah. I was, it was funny though, because in America, there's like, it's basically in Mayweather's gym, there's a vault, they're all vultures, aren't they? You know, they're all, there's like so many hangers on and everyone's trying to, when you're walking there, they all like trying to hustle you and, you know, like, oh yeah, you, 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 you've got to do this or you've got to buy this membership or yeah, you, you, you want to tie your hand, you want to wrap your hands for you. Yeah, it's going to cost you $100. You know, oh yeah, um, have you got any gloves? Yeah, it's going to cost you. They're all just on a hustle. And um, I don't even know how we got the, the sparring in a beacon. I think we tried to get some sparring. There wasn't literally no one in there. And there was only a Biku. And he says, yeah, yeah, come in tomorrow. And then when, I, when I, we sparred him, he was all right, a Biku. He was just a bit... Um, it was strong, you know, when I sparred him, he was strong, but he just didn't, I, I just felt like he didn't know what, I don't know, sometimes I feel like some fighters land on the feet, but they actually don't really know what they do, if you know what I mean. 
You had uh, a run of fights back here that obviously we mentioned Josh Well. You then fought Marot, uh, Isaac Netty, and Jazza for yeah. the first time. Yeah. Um, you and Jazza. I mean, it was it was a it was a tough early fight for you guys, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was a it was a big fight for both of us at that time. Had you I sparred did, by then? Because I know you sparred. Yeah, Brown I sparred them before then a few did times. You? To be fair with you, he sparred me and Lee Wood in this gym. Okay. And um, it was all right, Jazza. But I just knew I had his number, if you know what I mean. Because when I sparred him, he was good. But I just knew. You know, when you just know you can... I just knew I had his number, if you know, if you know what I mean. And I think when I boxed him the first time, I was sparring a few kids and I bashed him around the fourth. I'm going to smash this guy. And when I got in the fight with Jazza, he he didn't step it up, but he come out very fast. And I thought, oh, he's coming out fast. He's come out very fast for these, you know, for these first early rounds. But I just thought, I knew at some point I was going to stop him. Do you know what I mean? And um, What, that he'd set a pace he couldn't keep? Yeah, I knew, I knew, because I sparred him loads of times, and I just knew the pace that he was setting was just too, was, was just too um, fast for what it was. There have been talk, by the way, of you, and I think this was after the Jason Booth fight, of you fighting Kiko Martinez. Yeah, I was supposed to fight Kiko a few times, but that fight never come off. That one that you always fancied. I always, I always wanted that fight because I thought Kiko built for me perfectly. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I just think, I don't know. I just think with Kiko, because I switched, he probably didn't want to ever fight me. No, he couldn't ever get himself he, set. Yeah, yeah, he wouldn't be able to. And I think because all I had to do f to fight Kiko, as long as I stood Salpo, he won't know what day it is. Because I'm not being funny. Rendon Monroe boxed his head off. Rendon Monroe wasn't the best boxer. He was tough and everything else, but. He was a terrible boxer. By the way, what was the story about you and you being in a training camp with Junior Witter and you ran through an avocado orchard and speared your head on a branch? Oh, I was only about 14 or 15. Went in, we went to some, we were in Gankin area and we're, um, there was like a, we went to paintballing, but the paintballing was like in an avocado, like you said, avocado field, but they were like, you know, like, a fake tank and you know trees okay. and like little thingies like a fake military yeah setup. but then i had the mask on you know the the thingy mask to stop you from thinking it was a bit high like that so as i've ran underneath this thing because i didn't want to get shot this avocado thing just sliced my head here you know top of my head i thought oh yeah that i've about bastard that it so i'm like sitting there like that. then i'm thinking oh there's all that red you know on my mask you know the the face thing all red and i'm thinking oh fucking, i've been shot on this fucking someone shot me here so I've just took off, I thought, oh, fucking, I had blood, all oh, blood come out. Bed, blood was pouring, I just pulling out. I said, oh, Junior, I have it in my head. So I said, oh, is it any bad? Is, is it bad or what? And he's like, he went, no, nah, it's not really bad. So I'm like, holding on, got to, it took me to the doc, took me to the hospital. I had st like 15 stitches or something put on it. But he, he's actually got a video recording of him, like, you know, like. Oh, no, you can see down to the skull. Yeah, you can see down to the skull. That's rank. I know. Um, have you got said, a scar there now? Yeah, this one, that's the one, man. Yeah. Jeez, that's savage. They were massive, you know, when I think they were massive, it's actually closed up a bit now. But he, uh, I said to my junior, is anybody? He goes, no, it's not really bad. And then afterwards, go, oh, it's really bad, I just didn't want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put your whole hand in it. Yeah. Jeez, are you and junior close? Have you been close? Yeah, you know, I've known junior for a very long time. And uh, the thing is, you close, it's the thing is with people in this gym, yeah, I talk to everyone in this gym, even people who've left and gone. I still talk to most of them. Do you know what I mean? The thing is, because you've spent so much time with these people, it's uh, it's different, isn't it? Have you got a closest pal from here? Um, not really. You know, the thing is, everyone's your friend in the unit. When you spend so much time, there's not a person that I've spent more time than than I haven't. Well, what I thought was good was when we spoke after the fight, how much credit you gave to Dom Ingle, because obviously everyone, yeah. myself included, was playing the narrative about Brendan and how you were the sort of last of the Mohicans, yeah. the last one that he'd spent last time with. Last of the dying breed, they say. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so obviously that was the story, but obviously then you said, well, hang on, Dom's done a massive amount of the work. Yeah, the, the thing is, when I was turning professional, Brendan was okay, but he wasn't... The Brendan, when he trained Nassim Hamid or Johnny Nelson, he wasn't as sharp as he was then. Some days he was okay, some days he wasn't. So from like 14, 15, Dom actually trained me. And he trained Junior, and he trained Kel, and he trained Johnny Nelson. 
But Dom never wanted the credit, or Dom's like, oh yeah, make sure you give me a shout. Dom didn't want to just tell, just just mention me that that was it. He's not really bothered about taking credit or anything like that. And um, if it wasn't for if it wasn't for Dominic, then I probably wouldn't be boxing because when Brendan passed away, who else would have trained me? Or when Brendan was going a bit, what he wasn't when he was losing it a bit. You know, if it wasn't for Dominic, then we probably would have overtrained or not being ready for a fight because mm. Dominic kept on top of everyone. Yeah. And he doesn't get the credit now. It really is one of the top trainers in the country, does he? Yeah, 100%. People still think that he's Brendan's son. Yeah, but the thing is, he, the thing is, when you're in the boxing world, you do. I think more of the civilians don't know. But when you're the hardcore boxing fans, they all know. Or the boxing the people who are involved in the boxing know. And the thing is, he's always going to be Brendan's son. Because his dad's done so, Brendan's so massive, you're always going to be Brendan's son. Yeah. But he's not bothered about that. Uh, I mentioned pals in the gym. One of the people that you did become close to over the years was Billy Joe. Yeah, 100%. I still speak to Billy Joe all the time. But that's what I'm saying. When you're in the gym, you spend so much time with people. Billy Joe lived with me for about two and a half years. I came and interviewed you guys, yeah. didn't I, and, together and, for BT? And, yeah, and Kels lived with me. A lot of them, Adam Etch is another one who lived with me. You and uh, um, Billy Joe got headlines for the wrong reasons a yeah. few years ago. Yeah. Um, if you could get that back, I guess that's one of the things that you would probably take back in terms of what happened with that video. What video? With the lady, with the uh, lady on the side of the street. That wasn't stuff. me. I wasn't. I wasn't involved in that one. Were you not? No, I wasn't. I heard that you were the cameraman. No, I wasn't. I don't know. I told you that. Tris, you're making things up now. I was not involved in that one, Tris. Oh, okay. Okay. I was sure. No, I was sure I'd seen it. No. Okay. Uh, did you see me in the video? Mm, no, but I, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a while Tris ago, is wasn't it? Tris is trying to basically put me in some trouble now, isn't he? I thought you got in trouble for no, it. I didn't, no, I didn't. Billy I didn't. Did, didn't, I didn't, I didn't they pulled me up. Yeah. But they, I didn't get in trouble. They asked me, they said, oh, wait. And I said, no, I wasn't in the car. Correct. That was it, really. But even then, that's me. Just like it's just like little silly things we used to do. Well, he did. We even with Billy, I did silly things with Billy. Not that one, but other things. But that's what I'm saying, you know, because we're both we get carried away. If you know what I mean, when we're together, it's kind of a, you know, when you're in school and there was a kid that you know, if you were with him too long, you would get yourself into silly trouble. That was what me and Billy Joe were like. So when cause we needed Dom there just to keep us in check, because when Dom wasn't there, we'd get carried away a bit. Me and Billy. Okay, I see. I see that. So was that was that a good period? That not obviously that particular bit, but was that a good period when Billy was up here? Yeah, you they that? were good because I learned a lot of Billy Joel. You know, Billy Joel was probably one of the. Billy Joel had more. He was probably the most talented person I've ever met in my life in terms of boxing, inside the ring. And just in terms of skill, he knew what to do. He could, just in terms of just fighting. I thought he was a great fit up here for Dom's style. Yeah, 100%. And I believe that as well. But, you know, with Billy Joel, he just, he couldn't, I don't know, I just thought when he got in here and he settled down, it was just a bit different for him then, you know, because he settled down. Billy Joel, when he settled at some place, he kind of like, he he knows his way around. He kind of gets up to no good then. But when he doesn't, he's okay. Because he's on edge because he don't really know no one. He doesn't know. And that's the kind of thing with Billy you have to put in him. What's um, Liam Williams like? Liam Williams is completely different. You know, Liam Williams is like... He's someone who's got a similar intensity to you. and similar Yeah, passion. Liam Williams is just like... He's full on. You know, Liam Williams, you don't have to wake him up or tell him how to train or anything like that. He comes in here and he trains. And when he trains, he, every session... He kills himself every single, no matter what it is, he, he gives 100% no matter what. Do you know what I mean? Everything, if he's, if he's running or whatever, he gives 100%. He doesn't, he, it's just weird with, with Liam. He's completely, I think he'll be a world champion in the next 16 months, 100%. Who's the best trainer, take yourself out of the equation, that, that you've seen through the doors here? Um, it's all different because you all probably, you know, the thing was probably Kel. When he fancied it. Yeah, when, no, when he was on, when Kel was on job, Kel was on job. But even Liam was a good trainer. 
you know what I mean? You, te- you said about Naz and his potential, perhaps not fulfilling his p- potential, potential yeah. even though he had a fantastic career. Yeah. Is Kel in danger of d- being in the same boat? I think Kel, I don't think... And someone asked me this the other day, I'm telling you now, Kel should win everything from, light- from welterweight to middleweight. People go, oh, yeah, you're crazy. I'm telling you now, if Kel was on it, Kel could have won everything from welterweight to light middleweight, or middleweight, sorry. Easily, that's how good Kel was. Kel had everything. It was really disappointing when he beat Sean Porter. It was so disappointing that the door didn't open for Pacquiao, Thurman, Danny Garcia. But all then those fights guys. were never going to open. But he could have moved up to a different way. And, and they could have done. I mean, they, he could have. Hey, if he brought he brought the IBF title to the to the table, that was a good enough reason for some people to fight him. But he was still too high risk. Yeah, and that's Low how it, and, and look, and that's just how it is sometimes. Sometimes fighters like Joe Kawasaki, it took him ten years to get unification. So Ricky and didn't. So, but some fighters they get carried away because they think, oh yeah, it doesn't matter. Your job is to keep on winning, keep on top of what you've got to do. And when it when that time comes, it comes. It was just like when he won the world title. He didn't know when it was going to come, but at some point it was going to come. How have you got the patience to have done what you've done through boxing politics? Because obviously you're basically talking about Kel kind of not having the patience to wait for, for that time. You've waited and waited and waited. Yeah, because that's what it is, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to wait. And when you t- everyone, you, your opportunity is going to come. But when that opportunity comes, you've got to be more than ready. Because when you're doing this every single day, you, your time's going to come. You've just got to just make sure when it does, it, it, you've got to be ready. Everyone, everyone, do you think, you know, people think, look for, look for instance, look at Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather was a world champion at 20 years old. When did he become a household name or was in super fights? He wasn't, no one knew who he was until he boxed uh, Oscar De La Hoya. But he, he, he went from, from super featherweight, lightweight, light welterweight, to, to welterweight. He, went, he was a four-weight world champion before we even knew who he was. Sure. But that's just how it is. That, but, you know, you can't compare yourself to him. But that's how long it took him to get to where he's getting. Marvin Agler, it took him forever and a day to become a world champion and then do what he did. Joe Kazik, Joe, Joe Kazik was the same. Yeah, Ricky Atten, yeah, he did become a house. Uh, Ricky Atten had one name, big fight, then the next one, then the next one, straight away. But that's just how it, everyone's, everyone's um, path is different in boxing. You can't look at someone else's and think, yeah, well, the out, mine's gonna sh- mine should be like, it doesn't. Have there been times where you thought, you know, it's just not happening or it's not going to happen? No, never, never. Because, you know, the thing was, I knew it was going to happen at some point and I had to make sure when it did, I was more than ready. And so tell me about this thing, because obviously you, you are, and we've spoken about this in the past, but a full-time fighter. Yeah. You know, a lot of people talk about um, uh, training camps and, you know, yeah. having to train through birthdays and Christmas and see it as a hardship. But for you, it's always just been a way of life. Yeah, of course it is. And then when I hear fighters, yeah, you know, I've not had my birthday or this. And I just think if they get in the room with me, I'm going to smash into pillow to, I'm going to smash them from pillow to post because that mindset is just weak and it's like, at the end of the day, this is what we do. We haven't got nothing else. But, you know, if, if you are the business, would you close your business down because it's your birthday? No, you wouldn't because you'd have to open the shop because it's a shop or whatever it is. It still, it still runs on this day. But not, me, not many people have that mindset, do they? No, You've got I, to see it. Does it frustrate you when you see people who have had four or five pro fights saying, oh yeah, looking forward to getting back into training camp? You no, think, well, where I, have you been? I, I, just, I, just, I just think, don't let them come across me because if they come across me, I'm going to smash them from pillar to post. Because having that mindset is just, even when I hear fighters, oh, you know, I had a good eight-week camp, and I just think, eight-week camp. Or people tell me, oh, you know, I've had a good camp, and I just think, these guys are on about, they've had a eight, good eight-week camp. They could have had a six-week camp when they get in the ring with me. I've had a 19-year camp, a 19-year camp. how's that going to beat me? You know, I just think they're going to get smashed from pillar to post. Why don't people train year-round? Why do people insist on this? On having training camps and losing weight in you know whatever just, where's that where's that mentality come from because it doesn't really happen in this gym do you know the thing is you know, old school fighters the marvin aglers the archie moores the sugar Ray robinsons and them that's what they did that's why they were so good where i don't know i, I think these trainers and now how it is 
fighters think, oh, you know, yeah, you just need to have a 12-week camp and then that that's it, you know. But it doesn't work like that, you know. It can only last for so long doing that. You'd imagine the 12 weeks if you were doing that. If so, say you had a say, say you, your next opponent is is named, you'd get 12 weeks to tactically be right for him. But the rest of the work should be done anyway. The condition, yeah, 100 percent. Even tactically, even tactically, it only takes a couple of weeks or whatever it is to do. But really, you know, why would you want to? You've been on holiday and everything else. What you, so you need a 12 week camp to get fit first, to get down your weight. Then for the last four weeks, you're going to get tactically, you know, your, 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 um, your, your tactics right. I'm fit, I'm strong, my weight's already on point. So if I've been, if I know I'm fighting you for 12 weeks, my tactics will be better than your tactics because you practice for four weeks, I practice for 12. I do love, I love the attitude, you know, of being a full time fighter, and I wish I saw it more. Um, it's something where this sport is so dangerous as well and exactly. so hazardous. You're, but you're fighting for your life. And the thing is, that's what separates the good champions from the great champions. You know, anyone can be a world champion. Anyone can, you know, uh, win a world title. But the key is to winning it and keeping it. And so it then, shouldn't be a hardship to, to miss a Christmas if you've got a fight coming up. No, of or course. Why, why would it be... For what reason? But that's what I'm saying. That's and it's a, but it's also a lifestyle choice, isn't it? Because yeah. you know, if you are living clean, people, some people see what you do yeah. and the way that you live and think you have no fun and you know your life is just hardship. But they don't understand that when it's a lifestyle, like that's a choice because you're comfortable with. with yeah, the choice and I you enjoy make. it. And I and the thing is, look, in life, if you want to be successful, anything you do, you people just want. Oh yeah, sacrifice a little bit. Oh, and a big reward. Sacrifice a little bit. Oh, and a big reward. It don't work like that. If you want a big reward, you've got to have a big sacrifice, and that's it. So if you want, you know, and, and that's just how it goes. There's nothing you can do. If you want to be, if you want to be great in this game and and achieve a lot of things, then you've got to sacrifice a lot. In 2014, you fought Adelson de, Sa de Santos yeah. down the road here in Sheffield. Yeah. That was your last fight for nearly a couple of years because you yeah. got banned. Yeah. You appealed, but it was upheld. Yeah. Um, first things first, what, what, what did you do for the nearly two years? I just trained. I just literally, I just thought, I remember Dom saying to me, because Dom and John said to me, oh, look, you can either pack up now or you can train through it. And, you know, it'll go, it'll go by quickly. He goes, or you can pack up. And I just thought, well, what else am I going to do? What else can I do? And I just thought, you know, things happen in life. Everyone always has uh, ups and downs and everything else, but that's just how it goes. If you get, get your head on and just get down and, and just go through it. Did you work? Did you have to work? Did you find work? No, I didn't. No. I didn't work. I, to be fair with you, I had a few, quit from a few houses and, you know, I was okay. You know, I was ticking over and everything else. And even then, the family and that helped me out in terms of my mum and stuff like that. So what happened? Why did you fail a test? And was it from the De Santos fight? Yeah, it was from the... Well, I don't think it was from the fight. I think it was after the fight. And uh, failed on drugs. And that was it, you know. The... The... Give me a two-year ban. So I appealed it, appealed it. And then... Eventually, I won appeal and they did not get down to 18 months. And then that was it, really, you know. There was a family dispute and um, that's it, really, you know. It sounds very far-fetched that your, it was your brother yeah. spiked a protein shake. Yeah. But the thing is, when things like that happen, it always is someone who's a family member or, you know, most people kill people. You know, 99 of murders, who is it? Do you know, you know so 95% of murders, who is it? Do you know who it is? Someone who you know. Someone who you know, or someone, it's either a family member or, or a friend. Did you know that? I didn't know that. No. Yeah, 95% of murders are committed by people who you know, a family member or a friend. That's what they say. So, what, so how did you know that he'd done it? Did he tell you afterwards? No, I didn't, because what it was, it, it was just a bit suspicious, and the way he was acting and saying things, I just thought... This guy's up to no good for some reason. And I knew, and then I said to my mum, and then my mum ended up getting out of him. And then that was it, really. But even then, it was too late. It didn't really matter because it was my own fault in terms of, well, I should have, I should have 
been on job with my, I should have been on top of everything myself. I shouldn't have left things about, and that's it. Where were you when you found out that you'd failed the test? Uh, do you know what? I, th I think I was at home, I got an email, and I thought, oh, look, what's this? And I kind of just, because the thing is, I just ignored it. I didn't, I didn't really, then I thought, then I got another email. Then I said, I thought, oh. then I rang John. I said, oh, John, I've got these emails from Thingy. And then I think he rang up, and he goes, oh, yeah, they said you failed the drug test. Then I was like, oh, yeah, but on what? They're like, oh, yeah, they'll send you the result. They'll send you an email and of everything. And that was it, really. Was it a hard period of your life? Because for a lot of people, that, that stigma remains, doesn't it? And you, yeah, I guess you still get it now on social media. Yeah, 100%, but that's just how it goes, you know. There's nothing I can do. The only thing I can do is keep on winning and, and turn up the results. And, you know, after every fight, you get a drug test. Even in camp, you still get drug tested. And that's it. You know, you can't, you can't undo that time. You can't undo what happened, and that's it. Was it a hard time for you? Um, yeah, because the thing was, I wasn't, I couldn't do what I wanted to do, and that was fighting. You know, that's all I loved to do was to fight. And um, but look, the thing is, things happen in life, and they either make you or break you. And and I believe, even to this day, I don't regret all that period of time because that's what builds character. What happened to the relationship with your brother? Uh, even to this day, I don't really talk to him ever. Just is he the one of the ones that's gone to prison? Yeah, but I don't really. But to be fair with you, I don't. The older you get, you spend less time with your siblings anyway. True. But has that ended your relationship with him? Yeah. But even with some of the other family members, don't really talk to him. Are they in Sheffield? Or some of them in Liverpool? Liverpool still, Hello. yeah. Um, what about your mum? Your mum, what do you mean? She, are you close with her? Yeah, but your mum's your mum, innit? No matter what, you know, I could kill one someone tomorrow. And I said to my mum, I didn't do it. She could have probably caught me killing the person. And I'd say, oh, mum, that wasn't me. She's actually the... But that's your mum, innit? That is your mum. Was mom. she at the Jazza fight? When you yeah, won? yeah, she was, was she? at Sheffield, yeah. What was she... Uh... She was over the moon. But to, look, at the end of the day, it's, it's your mum's eyes. You're always going to be angels, aren't you? Yeah, and, but, you know, but, but she was on the journey. She brought you to the gym all yeah, those she years did. ago. And, and, the and thing you is, said, I'm going to be a world champ. Yeah. And then here you are nearly 20 years on. Yeah, and the thing is, as I always said to her, you know, she's not going to have to work. When I'm world champion, I make enough money. You know, she's not going to have to work every day. And I always said that to her, even when I didn't have nothing, even to this day, I said to her, you know, I'm going to make sure she retires and she gets enough money where she don't have to have work again, buy a nice house. When you were banned, did you find out who your friends were? Did some people just leave you? Um, not? not really. You know, the thing was, I didn't really have... My same friends are my same friends now. So even, even at that period of time, I didn't have no tag alongs because I didn't... I don't really have tag-alongs in terms of, like, I don't really go nowhere, do nothing. Your friends are gym friends? Yeah, gym friends, but even my friends outside the gym are still my same friends. Even when I got banned, they were still... You know, I've got a few friends like Javan, my friend Javan, who you see him sparring today, Little Ahmed, Eamon, Tristan, Denied. They're my same friends I've had since I was eight, nine years old. And sometimes I don't talk to these my friends for about four or five months. But when I talk to them, it's like... Picking you know, it up from where yeah, you left off. There's not, there's, it's like, but that's it. You know, I didn't even, even when I was doing good, even like now, I still don't have tagalongs or I don't even go to places where people pat you. But I don't like stuff like that. Lots of people have accused Dom of being some sort of Sheffield drug star. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the, it's a, it, with Billy with the nasal spray, with yeah. you in the ban, uh, John Thaxton with the yeah. Nandrolone with the Maxim Muscle stuff years ago. Um, and obviously, you know, it's a, it's a well-worn thing on social media of Ingalls, Pringles and that yeah. sort of stuff. What do you say to those who say what they do about Dom and, and those, those sort of slants that, that people give things on social media and that sort of stuff? Um, you know, people, they just try and find things no matter what. Even before, you know, the stuff, that situation with me, it was, oh, yeah. He's a rat, you know, he can't punch, he can't... The people are always going to find something to, you know, to find against you. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, like, I don't know, I just... You could be... Look Look at Floyd Mayweather, for instance. Floyd Mayweather's a, probably one of the best fighters to ever live. Oh, yeah, he were boring. Oh, yeah, 
you know, he couldn't, he couldn't punch. Yeah, he was this, he was that. But people are going to find excuses and find things. And, and that's just how it is. I don't think... Floyd's Dan a great example, isn't it? Because he, yeah. people will say he beat Oscar when he was at the wrong side of the hill. He beat Manny when, you know, it's five years too yeah, late. He beat um, Marquez when he brought him down in weight and all the rest of it. There's an asterisk, you know, Ricky, he brought up in weight from 147. You're right about that as, as an example because, you know, Floyd, if anyone wants to shoot holes, they can do. But yeah, like, but that's just how it is. His work speaks for itself. The thing is, you could fight everyone in the prime and people are going to still say, oh, it was this and with that. Yeah, he was ill. You know, oh, yeah, his toe was broken. Oh, yeah, his finger was hitting. People are always going to find something or they can find something, you know. Oh, he was actually crappy. He weren't any good anyway. But that's just how it is, isn't it, people? That's, I don't think Dom really cares anyway. He doesn't. You never really hear him go on about it or anything like that, but that's just how it is, and people can say what they want to say. Then the day he's he's still getting results, and if people want to say this and say that about him, it don't matter, does it? Because we're in this gym every day with everyone, so we all know. It doesn't bother him, does it? No, he doesn't care. Um, how do you feel you come across in interviews? Um, I don't know, a bit boring, a bit serious, a bit. <laughs> do you think yeah, so? Yeah, but the thing is that look. At the end of the day, you, how, how do you think Floyd Mayweather comes across in an interview? Boring. How do you think Chris Ronaldo comes across in an interview? Boring. Do you know all these great fighters, what you see, or great athletes, they all come across because that's all they know. I don't, uh, so I see people coming across but, individually, doing what I do yeah. and doing these sit-downs. But the thing is with you, you're a boxing fan, so it's a bit different. I'm just saying in terms of... Uh, um, as a civilian fan. Sure. The boring. The only people who you're going to find exciting is the Conor McGregor, is the Ricky Hatton, because they're common, they have a laugh, they have this. But the thing is, you know, they come up short against them kind of fighters because they like to mingle with everyone else and have a laugh and everything. You can't, if you want to be a winner, you've got to have the mindset of the Chris Ronaldo's or the, you know, Floyd Mayweather's. There's nothing else, you know, there's nothing else about them I suppose this is where, kind of where I'm coming from because you have that winner's mindset and some people might perceive that as arrogance as well. Yeah, but, yeah, but some people do say, yeah, oh, you're ignorant or... But that's, but that's people's opinion. No matter what, people are always going to love you and people are always going to hate you. Do you have arrogance people... in you? Or is it confidence? Or... No, it's confidence, but the thing is, people are going to find something against you anyway. Like, you could be confident, you know, oh, but he's arrogant him. That's just like, oh, then, then the, the most what they knew is like, oh, yeah, they won't say he's skillful or he's good. Oh, he's tricky. You know, that's the one what they knew is not what they like to news now. Yeah, you know, he's, he's a tricky, he's tricky. And what what do it? you think? That's a backhanded compliment. It is a backhanded compliment. Do you know what I'm saying to you? Yeah, you know, he's tricky or he's dirty or, you know, they won't want to say he's skillful or anything like that. You know, oh, he's technical. Yeah, you know, he's just a tricky. He's got. A, he's. Uh, he's. Uh, that's the one. Awkward. One thing I found really interesting that I heard in an interview of Andre Ward a couple of years ago was how commentators and bo the boxing media doesn't give elusive fighters enough credit, and that we are constantly praising the warriors that go toe to toe all yeah. the time, and we don't give enough credit to the people that don't get hit that are able to not get hit and that kind of stuff yeah do you see that do you agree with that in the yeah. sense that also that you know we want these guys to have good lives after boxing yeah. and have good longevity yeah. and that means that don't get hit as much clearly yeah so we should be praising the masters of the science rather than the guys who come and have tear-ups every every time yeah a hundred percent but the thing is do you know what's mad you know if i like to watch boxing do you know who i like to watch cool. i like to watch i'd rather watch Manu Pacquiao or floyd mayweather because it depends on if you want entertainment, you want to watch Pacquiao. But I still appreciate, appreciate everything that Floyd Mayweather does. I would rather fight like Floyd Mayweather than fight like Pacquiao. But you'd rather watch Pacquiao? But I'd rather, I'd rather watch Pacquiao. Do you know what I'm saying? And it, it, of course, it is, it is more entertaining because they're getting hit and it's more, there's blood and everything else. But you wouldn't want to be a part of I, I think, you know, you know Barry Hearn before, before this lockdown? Sorry, before the press conference, because oh, your last fight was good, but before that, you know, your box is a bit boring and everything else. I was there when he said that, yeah. wasn't I? In the yeah, garden, yeah, yeah. But you know, I felt like saying to him, you know, if you if Barry Hearn was a boxer, who Barry Hearn would be? 
Yeah, you, well, in, in terms of what? What style? No, yeah, what style do you think he'd be? Well, he'd probably be a slugger, wouldn't he? He wouldn't be a slugger. Do you know why I wouldn't be a slugger? Because he takes no risks. Right, okay. Because if you look in business, he doesn't ever take no risks. Sure. He, he would be Johnny Nelson. Calculated. He calculated. Because when you, when I, I've read... <laughs> Tricky and awkward. Yeah, and I've, and I've read, <laughs> I've read, I've read, um, I've read, um, well, I didn't read, I've got the order book, you know, the rent, Rentless, Eddie Haynes book. Yeah, yeah. And his dad is very calculated. And he's fair, but everything is calculated. You know, just everything he does, you know, everything is, a, you know, he won't rip people off. If he says he's giving you this amount of money, he's giving it to you. You know, everything, he makes a percentage on whatever he does. And that's why he's, he's, that's why he's successful in what he does, because he takes minimum risks. Mm. You know, he might take a 10% risk. Where, like, Johnny Nelson was the same. And then I felt like saying that, I and mean, the next time I'm going to see him, I'm going to tell him that. Because it is, it's true, though, isn't it? Because that's how fighters are. You remember, a fighter is a fighter outside the ring is how they are inside the ring. Yeah. So when you see Floyd Mayweather, Floyd Mayweather as a character, he really takes no risks. If you think about it, even when he fights, is everything's calculated. Sure. Everything's, you know, everything like he'll make sure, you know, when he gets in that ring, everything's perfect, everything's calculated. Just, just the way he is. Well, to the point almost where, going back to where we were, where he does have the scales lopsided, where he yeah. does say, you know, he'll fight you at a catch weight and he'll fight people on his But stands. that's calculated. But yeah, of course. It's all course. calculated. But then when you see Pacquiao fighting, Pacquiao, you know he comes from nothing. Even though Pacquiao, Floyd come from nothing, but Pacquiao, sorry, Floyd come from nothing, but Floyd was still in the Olympic system, so he's still getting paid, he was still getting some form of money. So he didn't have it like Pacquiao had it. Where you know when you see Pacquiao, when he fights, it's re he's relentless because you know he comes from absolute nothing. Mm. And you can see the character. I always believe that a character outside the ring leads inside the ring. It's difficult with the Floyd thing because his... Dad and his uncles were fighters. Yeah, they had and nothing, but he still come through the amateur rankings sure. in terms of, you got to remember, he was, on the, he was on the Olympic team and everything. And you still get money when you're on the Olympic team. He still got some form of financial help. Sure. And when he turned pro, he was still on good money. Yeah, Pacquiao sure, absolutely yeah, come from right. nothing. Sure. He probably was getting pennies. He probably living on the streets, not eating nothing. And even when he turned professional, he was more or less getting nothing until he made, until he become world champion. And when you look at him, you can see that inside the style of how they fight. How happy were you when you came back in, in 2016 after the ban and how good did it feel to be back? It felt good, you know. Um, but even then, it was still moving slow. But I just wanted it, because the thing was, it was like you're back on, you're back moving again now. Now you need to get yourself back on track. And then you had fights with Moira Hernandez, uh, Cayetano. Yeah. You're moving in the right direction, but you still have this unwavering belief that you're going to be a champ yeah because I just we just had to close in on something and the thing is you know you have to take a route what you know you're going to definitely get a shot at the world title and we knew if we went the WBC or WBA route we're really going to get a shot because of just how it is with everything else so we really wanted to go the IBF route because we knew 100% they 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 will implement their mandatories and you've got to take your mandatories no matter what. And that's the route we decided to go on. And you had really your uh, breakout, would you call it your breakout win on the world scene in 2018 when you fought Toka Khan? Claire? Yeah, you know, I, I just believe, even when I boxed Toka, that was a fight no one really wanted to take because Toka was a dangerous kid. He wasn't dangerous, but he's a hard piece, he's a hard person to beat. And he's probably one of the best kids I've boxed because he was good at what he did. He was 25 and one, so he'd only yeah. lost one fight. And he was technically good. You know, technically he was strong. He could dig a bit. And he was very hard to hit clean. And he's just one of them fighters What you have to be really on point to beat someone like him. And he was just a fighter that no one really wants to fight. Even till now, he don't get no fights because nobody wants to really fight him. You fought him in Boston. Obviously, yeah. we, we've spent some time talking about Naz, who lit up New York against yeah. Kevin Kelly. Um, do you have a bucket list of places you want to box or things you want to do? Obviously, you've mentioned about unifying and moving up. Yeah. What else is on the, the Kid Galahad hit list? Um, I just want to... Do you know the thing is, I don't really... Because when you get in the ring, for me, I just get in the ring. It don't, really, it don't really matter where it is. I swear to you, when I get in the ring, when I was in Eddie's back garden, 
I could have been in front of when I boxed in Leeds when it was packed out. There was no difference because when you're in that fight, it is you fighting for your life. So for me, it's not actually about oh yeah, you know I want to box in this place or that place. Yeah, it would be nice to box in Madison Square Garden, and it, be, it would be nice to fight in Wembley Arena, or it would be nice to fight in Vegas. But really, you just want the fights. No matter where it is for me, I just want to be involved in these fights that fight the Navarettes. You know, there's no point saying oh I want to fight Leo Santos because the, ne- the fight is never going to happen. So I'm not going to tell you oh, I want to fight this guy knowing that the fight is not never going to happen because it's not realistic. You know, where most fighters they'll call out oh yeah you know this fight that fight. We know it's not really going to happen. Josh Warrington will call out Leo Santa Cruz and Gary Russell Jr. But the truth is, he's never going to... The only way I can... Because you're talking about the political divide between did, yeah, promoters and, that's and stuff. It. The thing is, if I want to, these fights to happen, I have to go over to PBC. Are you worried that you're going to get what Kel got, which is you've won the title now and no one, still no one wants to fight you? No, I think the Navarrete fight will be the one. I do. And, it, and if the thing is, and if it's not, I'll just move up anyway. You know, I'll try and get five or six defences, then move up. Um, Lee Wood also wants the Navarrete fight. Yeah, but the realistic, the truth is, is does Navarrete want to fight a regular champion? What about Lee Wood, by the way? What an outstanding win that was. Yeah, that was a fantastic win. And I'm not taking nothing away from uh, Lee Wood's win. But even before that fight, I think you might have asked me, and even Eddie, when when he was when Kanzu was fighting, you know, um, when he was fighting... Josh Warrington. I always said to Can who? Because who is he? Who is Kanzu? Where the where where's you're a boxing, you know you're boxing. What win has Kanzu got? What makes you you think he's got he's a monster? Well it's one of those, wasn't it? It was it wasn't who he beat, it was how he beat them and and, and, but once, how, right then? and once he started churning out the CompuBox statistics. Yeah, but the CompuBox box, it. it doesn't matter. No, no, but it doesn't matter that, if you that, throw... was the, that was the story. So that's what okay, people yeah. say. But I know exactly what I'm you're just saying. saying to you, but the thing is if you're a, if Ben Davison said to me before the fight, yeah. I interviewed him and he said, you know, we don't think Kanzu's that good. No, we don't. And I know, and I always said that. And the thing is, people go, oh, yeah, you, you need to give him credit where the credit is due. I do give Lee Wood credit, but I'm just saying to you, before this, before I even beat Kanzu, I always said, Kanzu's nothing. Because Lee was in this gym for a bit, wasn't he? Yeah, he trained. I've known Lee since I was 13, 14 years old. But I'm not taking away nothing from Lee. No, sure. But I'm just saying to you, but who's Kanzu? Yeah. There isn't. Kanzu is a, you know, he's no different to, I don't even know. He's just... I don't really think, to be fair with you, I think he's a poorer version of Gavin McDonald. That's why I think. There's, I'd be remiss not to mention, obviously, Josh Warrington in this. Yeah. We, I know we touched upon the amateur fights. When you fought him, uh, you thought you won and you still think you yeah, won? Yeah, 100%. And the thing is, I know he knows I won because he's gone on from, yeah, he wants to fight all these big names, you know, Navarrete, all these big names he's gone on about. You name his last two opponents. Who have they been? Well, Richie Lara and Takushi. Yeah. Do you think they? Do you think them? But they're wins? not the how, they're not the household names he but, wants. Okay, the but do you names. think that's a better? Do you think they're better wins than fighting Claudio Moreira or Jazza Dickens? Um. I, well, I suppose time will tell with Lara. But I'm just saying. But to, but I know what you're this, saying. At this point, do you think they're better wins? If you were seen them on paper, who is it a better win? He didn't win. He didn't beat. Lara, okay, so but it's I'm, not saying, even but I'm just saying on um, paper, yeah, I don't which know, is I, a big, I, which are bigger fights? Yeah, I probably, oh, I don't know. Well, put it but this yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I, this I know way. where you're coming from. Laura, coming okay, from. well, put it this way. Laura and Laura and Jazz Dickens were in the top ten. Yeah. Is that right or wrong? Talk that right. that French kid was never. He was number no, seventy five, sure. and. Laura was number 78 or whatever it was. Sure. And they put him, they pushed him up into the ratings. So therefore, that's just... I'm just telling that's just his tic He was doing the politics. He was he was trying to play the game politically and it backfired, though. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying to you, but that's that's the truth, yeah. isn't it? So sure. realistically, you can't go say you want to fight these big names. Then go hard, had you and him got the rematch, though, do you think it would have been a big draw after the 100%. fight? 100%. Do you reckon? Yeah, 100%. Because it doesn't matter. It's Leeds against Sheffield. And trust me, I'm telling you now... His soul is still in my back pocket. So you reckon thousands would have turned yeah, out? Yeah, but to it doesn't. But the thing is, it would have. Why wouldn't it have been? 
Because it wasn't a fight of the year contender and all the rest. It of wasn't, it. but that's just how it goes. Look, then the, the day when Tyson Fury boxed down to Wild in the first fight, was it a massive? Was it an ob- unbelievable fight? It wasn't. No, but, but the second the, fight would have been cachet, didn't it? But I'm of, saying the second. He, if he gets the hit, second fight would have been the second fight would have been better. I don't know. I don't know. I think we might agree to disagree on that one, but I I, I still see where you're coming from though. Um, and at the end of the day, it is mandatory. It's not nothing to do with anything else. He has to fight me it's not actually about oh yeah you know it, well it would have been me him fighting me would have been better him than fighting that laura or the other kid would have done better numbers than fighting laura or that french kid yeah exactly so there you just you just answered you just actually answered your own question one thing i wanted to ask you we talk obviously about you living the life of a fighter yeah. and stuff which obviously i'm full of admiration for what happens when you stop fighting then what it's a you different, do? then it's a different chapter in your life but in this at this moment in time in this at uh, now you know i'm just fully focused on where i've got to be and but what you're I've 31 got to do. you've got to start thinking like what no, uh, what does happen in the rest of your life you, you know in I'm quiet, thinking, whether it's in quiet moments or whatever nothing i don't i just you know as long as you know i achieve everything i've wanted to achieve in boxing and i've looked after my money and i'm financially secure then i can go and do whatever i want to go and do you know, if that's going holiday every month or whatever it is, you don't, I don't really know. But I'm not really thinking that far down the line. I'm not thinking, I don't ever think that far down the line and I don't ever think what I've done in the past. I'm just thinking about the next four or five steps ahead of me. With, you've got some properties, right? Yeah. Is that something that you will focus or not focus yeah, on? Yeah, that's what I probably, that... yeah, I probably will be focused on that 100% after. But the thing is, at this moment in time, I'm not fully focused on that. You know, I have got properties, but then I just let, you know, my mum look after them while I'm, while I'm doing this now. What do you need out of the sport then to make, to make it, to make your 20 years of sacrifice worthwhile? I want to, I want to achieve everything I want to achieve. I want to unify this division, move up to 130, do the same again, then move up to lightweight and try to do the same again. Do you have, a, are any of your goals financial? No, the thing is, of course it is because what we were prize fighters, we all in it for money, but that comes with it. That comes with win, winning and everything else. And the thing is, as long as you look after your money, then, you know, you'll be okay, won't you? Did Brendan teach you stuff about money? Yeah, you know, him and John, you know, I've been all right because I've always looked after my money and everything else. But look, some fighters make four or five hundred million and they go skin. Some fighters make five or six million and, and probably worth, you know, 15, 16 million at this minute time. It all depends. It's not about how much money you make. It's what you do with your money. What will be your reason for retiring then? Having, so if you, if you I'm going defend to re- your title, uh, add another belt, move up, win titles, you just walk away into the sunset? Yeah, I'm going to make sure when I finish from boxing, boxing, don't retire me, I retire from boxing. I'm not going to be one of the fighters who punch you or, you know, or, yeah, I think he's, he's, he's seen better days. You know, if you think about it, I'm 31 years old. Name me a hard fight I've been in. Yeah, I can't really. I've never really been in a hard fight, ever. You know, my miles, you know, if I was a car, I'd be, you know, a 1999 Honda with, you know, 500, 500 miles on it, if that. What's going to be your legacy? I just want to achieve everything, you know, in terms of, and you know, just unifying and just being one of the, you know, people say, you know, when they say, oh, one of the best fighters from England, they say, yo, there's that kid from Sheffield. He was, he was, he was good. You know, like when you go to America, when I go to America, the only Americans ever go on about they always say, they never say about any other fighter, but one fight, who do you think it is? I would say two. I'd say Hatton and Naz. No. When I went to America, the only person they ever said about, oh man, that boy, that boy, you know, that boy, that little boy from, um, from you know, what, the prince, the prince, because they actually thought Naz was a prince. Yeah. You know, the little prince guy, man, man he, could, he could fight, man. You know, he could talk, talk and walk the walk. And that's the only person the Americans, I think, actually ever say, yeah, man, you know, like, he's, he could do everything. And you want to be up there with someone like him. And he, even, like, Lennox Lewis was an unbelievable fight. He, he could even put Tyson Fury up there now as well. 
When you talk about legacy, um, what does it mean to you that you are the last of a dying breed, that you are the last link to Brendan? Do you feel a lot of responsibility with that? Not really, you know, I don't, I don't really feel. You know, the thing is what's weird is like when, you, when people always say to me, oh, you know, did you feel when you boxed Jazza, there was so much on the line, did you ever? And I said, no, I don't. I don't, even when people, like you just ask me now, oh, you know, you're the last one of Brendan's era. Do you feel any pressure? I don't, because I don't think about that. I just think about what I've got to do. You must be very satisfied to have brought the title back here, though. To, yeah, you know, in, in his to, to a certain degree, yeah. But you know, I want to, I want to, I'll be, I'll be satisfied when I've done everything that he's told me that I was gonna do. If you know what I'm saying to you, you know, I'm gonna make a load of money. I'm gonna, keep you know, it. Keep, keep the money exactly. I'm gonna um, win titles in three or four different divisions. That's what. Then I'll be satisfied. But until then, I'm not. You know what I mean? Because. You can't get carried away because there's been loads of people who won world titles. It doesn't really mean nothing. It's, it's, it's about winning it and keeping it and then defending and moving up and doing the same again. We're here, obviously, in the Ingle Gym. Have you ever sung in here? Yeah, all the time. It's Have a, you? Yeah, yeah. It's a shadow box in there doing red and yellow. It's a shadow box, but it's like shadow box and sing. Just go in here. Red and yellow and pink and green, orange and purple and blue. I can sing a rainbow, sing a rainbow too. That's the only song I knew. Um, and what else have you had to do in here that, that, that's helped bring out character? Um, Were you good, have you been good at the gymnastics? I'm not sure I've seen you do much of that. No, no, I wouldn't. I didn't ever do none of that, to be fair with you. But I can, I can flip over the ropes. Not the NAS style, but I can do the Eubank style. Okay. Um, but I, was, I never did none of that. I just, I just wanted to like, just get better. And Why not? Because I, so we've spoken to Ryan Rhodes, Glyn Rhodes. They and can do all of, that. What, they can what, why, why have they all done it? And why, why haven't you practised it? Just because you know what it was? I just thought it wasn't beneficial in terms of, I thought I just need to get better in boxing. It, you know, that bit of showmanship it good. was it was showmanship but the thing was you know what I used to hate more than anything you know, when I come to this gym there was that many good kids well there was that many kids they, were, they weren't good they all could flip the ropes like Naz they all could do the back flips the front flips everything but you know what the thing was when they got on the ring and fought they could not fight they could body spar they could get in there and do 20 rounds body sparring but when they got in a fight they'd fall apart and I didn't ever want to be one of them fighters where I thought I didn't want to be one of them when they're getting hit around the head or when you're open sparring, you know, you're getting bashed up or you're losing. And there was loads of kids, but guess what? They could all do the back flips. They all could do the front flips. But none of them could, none of them could actually just basic boxing. And I just thought, look, if you want to be a good at this, it's just the basics you've got to be a master of. So it's not a question of you trying it and stacking it and making a fool out of yourself and not doing it again? No, no, I never, I never, I, did, I just thought you just need to practice the basics. I just need to just get the basics all, because I, when I used to look at them, I think, why did they always used to get beat? We had loads of kids in this gym, and they all could do the back flip, the front flip. We had Ali Nasser, Mohamed Al Suru, Red Fan, um, Samuel Mason. We had loads of them. I'm telling you now, and I was the worst one from all of them. But all I, I, I just thought, why are these guys getting beat? Because when you come in, here, they were all like the next Nas, basically, the next Nas or the next you know world champion coming through. And I just thought, why are these guys getting beat? And the only reason why they got beat was they never practiced the basics and they didn't have no discipline. It's interesting as well, because we, talk, we talked a little bit off camera about strength and conditioning. Yeah. So when Dom puts up videos, he puts p picture, uh, videos of yeah. Liam Williams, Willie Hutchison and stuff yeah. doing their strength and conditioning. I don't see you doing much strength and conditioning. No, no, we all, we all do. Yeah. I, we don't, the thing is, it's not really called strength and conditioning. We, it's weights. Look, at the end of the day, there's people call it S and C, CrossFit, um, strength and conditioning, cross training, cross course. whatever you want to call yeah. it. There's that that's that many names. It's really it's a load of shit. But really, if you want to get stronger and bring bring uh, build bigger muscles, what do you do? You lift weights and eat more. If you want to get stronger, not put and not put no weight on. You eat. You have a make sure you don't eat too much, and you lift weights because it'll get you stronger. That's just how it is, isn't it? No matter, you know, like, if you look at the old school, old school bodybuilders, that's what they did. And no matter what you do, that's what you've got to do, aren't you? So no matter when people come to, oh, yeah, what you want to do, get this kettlebell and you swing over here and does this. 
You're never going to do that because when you get in a fight, you're never going to lift up a kettlebell and swing it across. You're never going to pull up this and, then, and, and deadlift this. You, you, when you get in a fight, you don't do that. Yeah, it's okay to keep fit if you're not boxing and everything else, but really, do you do that in a fight? No, you don't. Which is why a lot of your stuff is sports specific. Yeah. To the point where a lot of your training is sparring. So you've yeah. come in and done 12 rounds this morning. The thing is, look, it don't matter. And, and sometimes what it is is, you know, some people just don't have the... It's hard to explain, you know, like... Do you think you could be a long-distance runner? Yeah, but it would take years. How many years do you think it would take? D what's the distance? A marathon. Oh, a year. No, it'd take you longer than that. Just say for long distance. To be a top level after. Oh, God, no, I couldn't. You I could couldn't, never, because no. really, you're not built like, you, no. you're, you're like, you, yeah. you're probably got, you're, you're a sprinter, aren't you? Yeah. But the thing is, people coming to this gym, and that's what it's like, it's like, they really haven't got something, they haven't really got it, but they think they, they, think they can get it. No matter what some people do, I've seen kids in here who, who are not really particularly strong, and they lift weights and they do this. And no matter what they do, they actually don't ever get stronger. They might think they're getting stronger. They might get better conditioning, but they actually never get, they, the punching power never comes. Right. And in this gym, we've had loads of people who were like that. And like, people have told me, oh yeah, you know, like, I used to go to this S&C gym, down thingy, down near, uh, in the, near the city centre in Sheffield. And I sometimes used to have to argument with the guy because sometimes he'd tell me certain things you know, and I was like, oh, yeah, but it's not. Like, it's something, oh, you know, if you jump higher, it, makes, it means you can punch out harder or something like that. And I went, that's nonsense. I went, what do you mean? I went, oh, so basically you're trying to tell me Tyson Fury can... So you're basically telling me Klitschko is going to beat Tyson Fury because he can jump higher, he can lift harder, he can lift more and everything else. I said, it's, it's nothing to do with that. How can you... You can't actually put a, a, a finger on it. Look at Deontay Wilder. You telling me that... The Klitsch goals can punch harder than Deontay Wilder. They can't because it's just some people just have something that others can't. And the more they do, they're never going to have it. You might get a little bit better, but you're not. And we've had loads of kids in this gym who really just like little things are missing. It's hard to explain or see. They just haven't got it. It's funny when you look at someone like uh, Anthony Joshua, who you'd imagine leaves nothing to chance in his prep, yeah. trying to get that extra 1% or 2%. You yeah. can fight someone like Andy Ruiz, who doesn't look for those same margins of one yeah. or two percent? But boxing is one of those where it's a great leveler. Where if you get hit on the chin, yeah. it doesn't matter whether Spe you've got one or two percent extra. But yeah. it's all over, S especially in the heavyweight division. And like I always think, Andy Ruiz, I don't know how he's not world champion. I don't understand how he's not done. But then again, you look at him and you think he's just got no discipline. He's not lived a life. Yeah. He's just got no discipline. He's a fat lump in it. And realistically, I know it sounds horrible and everything else. But realistically, he should be in the top. He should be in the top three or four because the guy can fight. Yeah. The guy's got amazing hand speed. He, he's strong. He can punch. He can do everything. Everything they can do, he can do. Yeah, sure. But Anthony Joshua just got better discipline than him. Anti Tyson Fury, and that's it. Have you got um, a time where you want to wrap? up your career by, are you thinking I want to be done by 34, 35? No, not really. As long as it takes? As long, as long as it takes. And the thing is, it's like, I just feel like I'm getting started and I'm getting better. What happens if I get to 36 or 37 and I'm still wiping the floor with people? Do you think I'm going to think, oof, I best retire now? Well, it depends. If you've got enough cash in the bank and you've ticked the boxes. But I'm just saying, but then they give you a fine and say, look, you're going to get this kid, it's two million quid here. Um, and I look at him and I think, I'll, I'll smash this kid from pillar to post. It, it'd be hard not to, wouldn't it? Yeah, but, but also it's one of those where the fighters are the last to know of, of obviously. And if you've, and you I, might, you might, you if if you're slipping and you don't see it, and someone and Dom says to you, you're slipping. Are you then, gonna listen? Then, yeah, of course I'd listen. Yeah, one hundred percent. But the thing is, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, I used to look at fighters like like the Marvin Aglers and the Andre Wards and the Hopkins, and I used to think, oh, like, why are they so good at what they did? Especially like someone like Hopkins, how can he be a world champion at 50? And people go, oh, yeah, he's this and he's that. And you know the truth is, when you think about it, all he did was just live the right life and he just wait, it, his time come. And then when he got to where he got, he kept on top of it. And all the kids who were coming through, they didn't live nowhere near what he did, hmm. how he lived. So he's got that much experience and everything else. 
it's going to be very hard to beat someone like him because he's just like there. No matter what these kids are going to do, they're not really going to get to that level what he's at. And as long as he keeps on top of himself, and eventually, yeah, Father Time will catch up with everyone. But, like, he was middleweight champion from what age? From 31, 30 yeah, to, like, like what, 38, 39? And no one could beat him, and he beat everybody. And that was just because he kept on top of everything. And you think that's accepted. You think, oh, my God. But really, when you sit that back, when I sit down and think about it, I think he was just more disciplined than all the others. And he lived a life more than all the That's all separates him from them, because he wasn't even the technically the best. It's amazing, isn't it? Because when, when you talk about someone like Naz, people talk about natural talent, which I don't know if that's an insult to people who are, who are very good, because they clearly practice over and over. Yeah. Um, Naz had more natural talent in his little toe than <coughs> me, Kel, Johnny Jr. Witter, and anyone else in the gym had. That's how good Naz was. But it's amazing how much stock you play into discipline and how much it gives you your confidence, the fact that you live the life. Yeah, 100%. And the thing is, it's like, I don't know, I think everyone's different. I know I'm not as talented as Naz. And, and I'm comfortable saying that. People go, oh, yeah, you know. But, you, but I've, I've been in this gym where people have thought they were better than me in every way but then when they get in there with me they just can't figure out why I'm better than them if you know what I'm saying to you they think oh you know I punch harder than him I'm faster than him I'm this and I'm that but then they just can't when we get in there and, and we we spar or something they just can't realize they don't know they can't really put a finger on it it's well part of it, it's a big part of it, it's your ability to adapt isn't it it is and it's the it's the mental it's it's all in your head isn't it? it's all I think it depends on what you do outside the ring as well, how you live your life, if you're messing about and everything else. And and I don't know, just some kids, they just they just find it hard, don't they? They just kind of like, I've, I've spoken so many kids who thought they were better than me, I swear to you. And I've gotten there and I've battled them from pillar to post. And when they get out, it kind of like, it takes the soul off them because they think they're better than me. And then it's like, you know, once I watched Carl Froch, um, training the ice, I used to watch him, I used to go down there and watch him train, and I watched him on the bag ones, and I thought, fucking hell, he looks useless, I see him on pads, and I thought, fucking hell, he's useless on pads in, he fucking looks terrible, and then I just watched him train, I thought, oh my god, he's terrible in, then I watched him get in the ring and spa, and all these kids look like, I don't know, Jermaine Taylor and all the rest of them, and he got in there, and I swear to you, he battered them all from pillar to post. And I just thought, oh my God. You know what I mean? Then I knew, you know, like, you look and you think, actually, all looking at, hitting them bags, hitting them pads and everything else actually don't mean nothing. Do you know what I mean? And then when he got in the ring, he just battered people from pillar to post. And I just thought, that's just crazy. And he was another guy who lived a life. He, he lived a life. He's another fighter that people, I think, in the UK underrest who he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. For me, I think he is the best super middleweight. I, I actually put him probably higher than Joe Calzaghe because of who he's boxed. He's boxed big names back to back to back to back to back. He had that massive run basically from Pascal through to the end of his career. Yeah, back to back to back to back. Yeah. Still, well, hopefully you get some big fights back to yeah. back in the coming future. 100%. Um, an easy one first, is it? There's no such thing as easy in this game. Remember that. There's never an easy fight. Just look at what happened to Laura, Warrington against Laura. He thought it was an easy fight, and then he ended up picking himself up off the floor. Which is why you're in here training. Exactly. For, uh, well, change, change it up, a homecoming. A homecoming. And then 20, 20 Navratti. It's big. Navratti. That's what we want. Ring Magazine, WBO, IBF. Ring magazine title on the line. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today. No it's great. Mine. Congrats thank you. on the title. Thank you. And thanks Chris. for having me down. No I appreciate mine. it. No thank you. Mine. Thank you.